at chapter 10, which is our method of analysis, and this is our next step in the research project and how we're going to analyze our data. And um, we're only going to do very simple data analysis. Um, so let's go through the chapter and um, look at how you do analysis. So looking at data from a quantitative study, um, you are going to put your data in SPSS, or we may use Excel, we'll just kind of see where we go with it. So to do that, you're going to have to code your data. And what that means is you're going to assign a number to all of the variables, um, people, phenomena, or concepts. An example of this would be, say you're going to code gender. We have female and male. So you would get, you can do it either way. You can make male one and female two, and you're going to code them that way to put it in to analyze the data. And um, it's easier to type things in numbers and keep things correct, and it's easier to follow. So that's why we change everything over to numbers. And then also it's easier for you to run um, your test. And the type of test that we can run or the measurement test that will be used is determined by the type of data. So remember, like, if it is demographic data, then we can only do very um, basic statistics like mean, medium, mode, or percentages. Next are the steps to follow to analyze data. The first step is you want to organize your data. And this is where you apply numbers to variables in order to input data into your software program. You also want a different variable styles and there's different um, measurement scales. And you want to look at those different things because they affect the choice of statistics to um, analyze data. You also want to um, examine and sort your data when you're organizing it. Um, and expect your data, inspect your data for accuracy. That's where you're going to go through and see if you do have like a survey that's missing numbers or um, if someone just marked the same number on everything, then you know that's not a valid survey because they just did something really quickly and random to get through it. Then next you're going to describe your data. And data is categorized um, using measurement scales, which we've talked about before, and we'll look at it on the next slide, which is your nominal, ordinal, um, interval, or ratio scale. And next, you analyze your data using either descriptive or inferential statistics. And then last, you're going to test your data. So looking at levels of measurement, um, the first level of measurement is the most basic, which is um, the nominal scale. And the nominal scale would look at um, name data, so naming without order. Measurement identity, you want to separate your results into two more distinctive features. And um, you would label or name an individual or groups or things into categories. So this would be like gender, age, color. An um, example of this would be method of gene colorization. So whether your gene garment dyed, acid washed, or stone washed. So those are at a nominal scale. Next is ordinal scale, which is rank order, and it reflects the um, rank order of individuals or objectives from um, high to lowest. You want to arrange you want to arrange them in order and there's no difference. Remember in ordinal there's no difference among categories. You can't say that from one cat from one to the next is an equal distance. Uh, examples of this were dress size, sheet sizes, and it often uses the Likert scale, which we, which you will all be using. Next is the interval scale, and it reflects differences among items, and it measures equal units. So you have equal units of difference between the measurements. So an example of this would be retailing sales figures viewed by quarters in a year. 
So each four months would equal a quarter. And, um, or you could do, another one that you could do is temperature at which fabric melts would be another one. And then last is your um, ratio scale. And your ratio scale is the highest type of measure, measurement. And um, it shows a relationship among scores. And it includes an absolute zero. So that's the big difference between it and interval, is that you actually have an absolute zero for it. And it compares items or variables. So example of this would be how much a sweater costs. You can use a ratio scale because you could say one sweater was two cost two times as much as a different sweater. So let's go to the next slide. Next is statistics are used for describing and analyzing data. And the type of statistics used depends on the research design and scale of measurement used with the data. And there's usually two different types of statistics used. You can either use descriptive or inferential statistics. And um, descriptive statistics help organize and summarize data in which the number, proportion, or percentage of subjects in each category is explained. And it, it tells what is found with the data. So it's very basic. Um, data that you're getting. Inferential statistics, they take what is found with the data and go a step further and they draw inferences about the larger population based on the sample surveyed and they employ inductive reasoning. So an example of this would be based on the last class lecture on qualitative research, students in RTL 4330 or more likely to understand qualitative research than other retelling students. So this is where we're employing inductive reasoning. Next is the distribution of data, which is the set of all scores to be described, and where the distribution is located on the scale of measurement. And it also looks at how the distribution is spread out. So how is it dispersed? Um, when a professor puts a grade, some classes they'll put the grades on the board, they'll show how many A's, how many B's, how many C's, and how many D's they have on their exam. This is the distribution of grades, so that's what they're showing. So they're showing how dispersed the grades are. And um, usually your distribution should be a bell curve, and um, the bell curve is the shape of it. In our next slide, we'll kind of show you what um, a bell curve would look like. This slide looks at the normal distribution of dress sizes for a buyer to order for a store. So in this, um, it shows that if you connected all of the top bars on this slide, so if we went here and connected all of these, it would look kind of like a bell and make the shelf look like a bell the shape of a bell curve. Um, and this is the normal curve. However, um, in reality, it's saying the average size for this or your mean would be size 8. But today, um, actually, they say that the average size, dress size now, is actually a 14. Some things to note about a normal distribution is that they are um, symmetric. Um, this is the bell curve. Your mean, median, and mode are located under the peak. This would be right here because your peak's right up here. And um, approximately 68% of the observations are within one standard deviation of the mean. Next, we're going to look at the measures of central, central tendency. And they identify the location of um, distribution, and they include the mean, median, and mode. And companies use the measures of central tendency all the time, because you can find the average price that was paid for an item of clothing by taking how much, um, how many shirts you've sold. So say we've sold 300 shirts, and the amount of the shirts money made on the shirts was $3,500.
So the average amount that's been paid for these is $11.67, which we just found our mean, which is where you add up all the scores and just divide by the number of scores. But it's a great way like for a buyer to look to see, okay, what did our uh, shirts actually, what price did they actually sell at? Does that mean we should lower the price, raise the price, or what price should we have promotions at? So should our promotions be at $12 when we promote the shirt to try to sell a whole bunch? Um, those are different things to look at if you actually were using the mean in your workplace. Next is um, median. And median is um, the point on the scale of measurement below which one half of the scores lie. The middle score in a distribution of the ranked scores is what a median is. So an example, in our example below, it shows you if you had even scores. So say you had um, seven scores, then the fourth score is going to be your median because it's the one right in the middle. However, if you had odd scores, so if you had six scores, then you don't have one that's in the middle by itself, so you take the two in the middle, so you take the third and the fourth score, and you divide it by two, so it would be equal to 17. So that's supposed to be an equal sign instead of a plus. And then the last measure of central tendency is the mode. And the mode is your most frequently seen score. So an example of, of our mode would be, if you look at all of the scores, the most frequently seen score is 5. Um, mode is not used often because sometimes you can have more than one mode. And if you have a small enough population, if your population is small, you may not have um, enough scores to really make a mode. Dispersion of distribution looks at how far the distribution is from the mean, median, and mode, which um, is our central tendency. And you identify dispersion of distribution by looking at measures of variability. And our measures of variability are range, variance, and standard deviation. Range is the simplest measure of variability, and it's calculated by finding the difference between the largest and the smallest score. So, for example, say our um, scores ranged from 3 to 30. That would mean our largest score was 30 and our lowest score was 3. So to find the range, you would take 30 minus 3, which is equal to 27, and that would give us our range. Next is variance and it's equal degrees of dispersion or the scatter of a set of numbers and it reflects the variability of scores in a distribution and it doesn't suffer, suffer from the limitations of range and um, it is the sum of squares is how you find variance. Next is standard deviation and it's built off deviation from the mean. It's the, dis the distance that an ob observation deviates from the mean. And it's equal sums, it's equal to the sum of deviation squared divided by the number of data minus one. And then if you look in your book, there is a big long formula that shows you how to calculate the standard deviation. Um, but I'll actually show you how to use the standard deviation in um, Excel or SPSS. So SPSS is the statistical software package that is used within our field of study to analyze research. Um, it's also used besides in academics and marketing, textiles, manufacturing, fa fashion design, and detailing. Looking at methods of analyzing qualitative data, you can't control the stream of your conversation and the results that you get in qualitative data. So you ha there's going to be a large amount of data and it's going to have to be organized and analyzed. And um, because you have open-ended questions, you don't really know what information you're going to get back or where it's going to go. You can also have visual data. You can have artifacts. 
we need to have oral interviews, which we all talked about um, in Chapter 9. Next is the phases of qualitative research. First is um, invention, and this is the research design or the plan of action. Next is discovery, and this is the observation or data collection that produces information. Next is interpretation, which is the evaluation, analysis, and understanding of data. And last is explanation, which is communicating, interpreting, and packaging to produce the message of research. And a lot of qualitative research is discovery and figuring out how things happen, but we have to be able to explain why people said what they said and why people think they what they think. So the expl explanation part is really important and the interpretation of what they actually said. Looking at your method of analysis, you have interpretation and thematic analysis. And you, you will see themes within your data um, when you're going through and um, analyzing it. Um, some examples of kind of some things that came out when we did the versus group at JCPenney is that people kept talking about they wanted different sizes, they didn't like the sizes that we had, or they didn't fit things they fit correctly. They also, um, things that came out were displays and how they wanted better s displays and how that they, they chose their clothing based on the displays. And um, once you find these themes, you need to organize and segment and then code and categorize your themes. One program that you can use to um, code your themes is called Atlas TI, and it is a software that um, you can use that will actually help with qualitative research and code things. Uh, we will not be doing that since we're not doing qualitative research. And one thing, if you ever do use that software, an important thing is still to go back and code it yourself because it is a computer program and it's not going to catch certain things that you could actually catch on your own um, if you did the coding yourself. Next is looking at coding. And coding attaches names to the collected data. So say you want to name your participants. So you just make up names for each of your participants and that way you can kind of track the data for each participant. You also, with coding, it looks at how the data is related and linked together. It also marks parts that talk about the same thing. So if you see the same thing over and over, you want to kind of start linking and putting those things together. It also ranks orders or does diagrams of different areas that um, are concepts that come up. Um, kind of like in J the JCPenney research, we found that displays affected what men um, bought, they didn't really affect what women bought. So it was really important to them to have a display, while women were kind of like, I don't even pay attention to this display. Coding also is based on themes, topics, ideas, concepts, terms, phrases, or keywords. And many times you'll see keywords. So one keyword of ours would have been displays. And it breaks everything down into segments. In coding, is where you everything is named or labeled so they can be easily um, recognized to bring meaningful comparisons or contrasts. Kind of like I said at the beginning, you want to have everything named. Looking at the coding process, process there's three types of coding. And coding is a process for both categorizing data and for describing the implications and details of these categories. So you're going to start with open coding, and it considers data in minute detail while developing some initial categories. So you would just do open coding at the beginning to kind of look at very specific details. Then once um, you get moving, then you're going to move to selective and sorted, sorting. <coughs> selective coding is when you um, systematically code with respect to the core concepts, and you keep the original items intact of words or pictures. And then sorting looks at categorizing or grouping together similar concepts for future analysis. So that's where if you have things that kept coming up, you would categorize all of those together.
looking at grounded theory, um, we don't use a theoretical framework for our paper, but if you were doing a thesis or a dissertation, you would have to have a theory behind your research. So an example would be when I did my um, dissertation, I looked at purchase intentions. So to say that I wanted to look at purchase intentions and that I was going to use certain variables, I had to have a theory behind using those certain variables to find purchase intentions. So for that, I used the theory of plain behavior, which is, remember, the theory we talked about that looks at attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral controls. And that's what affects intentions and purchase intentions. And after we collect the data based off of our theory that we used, then we can add in our own perception as to why the data or phenomena occurred. This is a emergent theory. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. It's in your book. Um, it looks at the variables of age and size and how age and size, or um, how people at different ages and different sizes look at different things in buying clothing. So it says, um, a kind of fun one is if you're older, fit is really important to you, no matter what size you are. While if you're young, a thing that's really important to you is store, a specific store. While if you're older and plus size, or if you're not older and plus size, but if you're older and normal size, store specifics are not as important to you as they are for the younger generation. So it's kind of some funny things because once you get to plus size, quality isn't even important to them. And also, it's only the older generation that's worried about um, the label size. So that kind of label size, we'd be kind of looking at how sizes differ per store or per um, brand and how um, young people, obviously, it doesn't bother them to wear different all different sizes. But for older people, they expect that one size is going to be the same everywhere and that they wear that one specific size. So if you go somewhere and you have to wear a bigger size, then they think something's wrong. Working with both quantitative and qualitative analysis, there's a whole purpose of analysis for establishing the meaning of the phenomenon. It also codes items into manageable categories. It quantifies certain aspects of qualitative data. It uses content analysis. It identifies recurring patterns or themes, and it codes into manageable categories on a variety of levels, from like say word, word sense, phrase, sentence, or theme. And um, it examines using content analysis, conceptual analysis, or relational analysis. And if you want to kind of look at the difference between content analysis um, and relational analysis, Conceptual analysis is how many times the concept or theme appears, while relational analysis looks at the meaning behind the data and how it's related. And to quantify qualitative data, it counts how many times the data or related subject matter appears, and then you enter that into SPSS or Excel. And content analysis is 